Good morning, and thank you all for joining us for this week's Stay Connected Facebook Live series. My name is Lisa Leff, and I'm sitting in this morning for my museum colleague, historian Edna Friedberg, uh, bringing you this program. We're honored in this series to bring you Holocaust history live from our homes. If you experience any technical difficulties during the program, please try to refresh your feed. If that doesn't work, be assured that once we're done, this program, um, which will be recorded, will sit on our Facebook page for you to watch later. Now this week marked World Music Day. Yesterday also marked the 76th anniversary of a historic musical performance of Jewish prisoners in the Theresienstadt concentration camp, also known by its Czech name, Terezin. So today we're going to talk about a Nazi ploy that was designed to deceive the world about what was going on in this camp. We'll also honor the courageous musicians who were forced to participate in their ruse. And finally, we'll take a broader look at how art and music helped Jew Jews survive and even find meaning um, in these terrible times uh, in spite of the circumstances that they lived in. I wanna welcome my interlocutor today, Murray Sidlin. Murray is the president and artistic director of the Defiant Requiem Foundation. He's also professor of conducting and music of the Holocaust era at the Catholic University of America. Welcome, Murray. Good morning, Lisa, thank you. I also want to ask all of our viewers at home to send in any comments or questions you might have in the comments section of our Facebook page. We're gonna to try to get to as many of these questions as we can live during today's program. So Marie, let's begin by setting the scene. What were conditions like for Jewish prisoners in Terezin? Uh, the nicest thing I could say would be deplorable. Um, it was a concentration camp. It was called a ghetto concentration camp because it actually existed in a small town. Terezin was a town since 1780. Uh, but the conditions were that the prisoners had two cups of gruel a day, nothing nutritious, according to uh, someone I knew who actually worked in the kitchen there. Uh, there was uh, at first some medical attention, then none. And there were never was any protection from the elements during the worst weather. So it was a place where people suffered. And uh, during the era of Terezin, which was approximately uh, late uh, 1941 till liberation in 45, 150,000 uh, people went through Terezin. And even though the town was built for 7,000 inhabitants, uh, very often during the, the Nazi era, some 60,000 people were there in an area built for, for 7,000. And look at the, this photograph of the horrible overcrowding in the camp. I want to welcome our viewers um, from Boise, Idaho, from Ohio, from Florida, from Virginia, as well as international guests watching from Chile, Mexico, Israel, Puerto Rico. Welcome, everyone. Um, we were just talking about the overcrowding in the camp. You know, it's remarkable that despite these horrible conditions, Terezin's remembered for its extraordinary artistic culture. Marie, tell us something about why the Nazis permitted art and music in this camp, which were, of course, not allowed in the other camps. Well, at first they didn't. There were three commandants at Terezin, as I recall, and the first two didn't want any of that. They wanted you just to, to work, get some sleep, eat the gruel, and die as soon as you could. I mean, they, they had a, a very uh, horrid, uh, inhuman uh, association with what their role was as commandant of the camp. The third commandant, uh, whose name was Ram, had a different idea. First of all, he was afraid of being sent to the Eastern Front, so he wanted peace and quiet, no disturbances. And he thought if they could participate in artistic activities, which many of them were doing sub rosa anyway, in, in basements or in attics. If they could do that and that would help take their mind off of the hunger, the lack of medical attention, it would keep peace 
uh, as long as there was nothing subversive going on, then he would be okay with that. So, uh, yeah, so it was a kind of control mechanism. That's right. Yeah, to 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 quell in advance what might have erupted. And I also understand that there were a number of internationally renowned musicians. Um, and I'd like you to tell us about one of these men, Raphael Schechter. Yeah, he was not renowned at that time, but he was a comer. Everybody recognized the fact that he had great talent. He was a, a wonderful pianist, extraordinary conductor, and uh, a most imaginative musician. He loved putting together choirs or uh, scenes from opera or full opera. I mean, he actually recruited and, and, kept, uh, and kept an artistic presence really alive. And also there was a lot of contemporary music being done there, Faith in the Future, people who were writing music that was going to be performed on some of these recitals. They actually had so many concerts going on that they had to put an, a little organization together, the, the free time activity who would schedule, who had the piano when, uh, who would perform where and so forth. And by the time Terezin was liberated, there had been over a thousand concerts there, including not only chorus uh, and, uh, and cabaret, but even a small jazz band called the Ghetto Swingers. Well, tell us about the music that Raphael Schechter selected for the performances that he led. At first, he put together a small chorus to sing uh, folk songs and to sing uh, the pieces from within operas, because when they put operas together, they needed a chorus for uh, pieces of Tosca or Magic Flute or whatever it was. And, and so he didn't put together major works until, until later on, he got the idea that uh, his, uh, one of the works very close to his heart was the Verdi uh, Requiem. The, the famous Requiem Mass by Giuseppe Verdi. And he had this idea that this is a work that he ought to tackle, that he ought to recruit and put together a choir and, uh, and see if they couldn't perform uh, the Verdi Requiem. Wow. Wasn't it controversial in a camp among Jewish prisoners to perform a Catholic Mass? Highly controversial. There were, there were a lot of Orthodox Jews. And once the word got out that he was doing this, there were a lot of objection, objections raised. There was an organization within the camp called the Council of Jewish Elders. They mainly were in charge of who got deported and transported, but every now and then they would tackle these sociology, sociological problems. So yes, they brought it to Schechter's attention that if you do this, you're gonna create mayhem and havoc, and you know how the Nazis are gonna deal with this. But Schechter's response to them was this, look, the meaning of any great work, any great work of art is never limited to its original meaning. It's never limited. And we know this from, uh, I mean, are, are only Christians allowed to, to look at the Pietà of Michelangelo and cry? Are only Christians allowed to, uh, to uh, feel the intensity, the religious intensity of the St. Matthew passion? Or can the rest of us have in on all these works of art as well? So his point was the Verdi Requiem was a great work of art. It was an amazing piece of music. And it turned out that it had some other possible offshoot meanings as well, but at least it, it should not be limited. It should not be limited to the Catholic intent. I think you're telling us something really important about the universality of music, which is one of the things that makes it so special. Yeah, I have to tell you, every time I hear the Beethoven Third Symphony, I don't think of Napoleon. <laughs> I think of Beethoven. Yeah. I want to send greetings to our viewers watching from Germany, from Montreal, from Nicaragua, from Ecuador. Good morning, everyone. Please send in any questions or comments you might have, and we'll try to answer them in today's program. If we don't have time to get to your question, we'll do our very best to answer it in the comments section after our program concludes. So getting back to our um, story, Murray, um, during this time, while the camp was operating, Terezin was selected for a special visit by the Red Cross. Can you tell us about why this came about? Yeah, I'm not sure selected is the right word. It was, it was provoked by the Danes. Uh, the Danish king was really upset because some 300 or so Danes were arrested or there wasn't, uh, however other Jew, Jewish 
uh, Danes got out, they didn't make it and they were going to be arrested. And uh, so the, the Nazis were aware by this time of the rumors that were circulating about the treatment of prisoners in other camps. So they were going to be very careful with this one, not to irritate the Danish king who had an audience, who had, who had the uh, access uh, to denounce the Nazis if, if that were uh, the case. But uh, so they, they, they sent these uh, Jewish Danes all the way down to Terezin. And I in see, Terezin- here we have a photograph, sorry to interrupt Murray, but I see a photograph has come up of Danish Jews arriving in the camp. Yeah, and they gave them a special place in the camp that supposedly was cleaner and, uh, and, and better appointed for, uh, for living conditions. It really wasn't that much different. But the Danes did have access to packages that other prisoners did not have. And so now to make sure that the Nazis delivered on their promise, the Danes, Danish king insisted on a visit from the International Red Cross. And that did take place. And it took place, uh, as you said in the opening, 76 years ago yesterday. That was the day of the International Red Cross visit at Terezin. Okay, and we have a comment coming in from one of our viewers who points out as, you know, kind of underlining what you said, how different the Danish government was from other um, governments in occupied Europe. She tells a story that she heard of Denmark paying to keep Danish Jews alive. That might fit with what you said about the care packages. And that when these Danish Jews returned home, um, their houses had been watched. I, I'm not familiar with that story, but it is remarkable how different um, the Danish king was, uh, even in provoking this visit um, by the Red Cross. Yeah, the, the Danish kings thought of these people as Danes first, not Jews first, but Danes first. And he would do anything he could uh, to bring attention to the fact that they deserved, first of all, they did not deserve to be in prison at all. Uh, but I don't think he could stop the Nazis from that dastardly action, given what was going on all over, all over Europe. But he could try to control the circumstances so that the Danes were given preferential treatment of some sort. And he also certainly couldn't control what the Red Cross saw. Um, I want to turn now to the question of what the Nazis did in preparation for this Red Cross visit, really, because they, they really had a lot of control here. Yeah, they set up what we would call Potemkin Village. You know, there were fake storefronts. Uh, there was a, a cafe, a coffee shop. Uh, there was a library and there was a bank uh, to give the illusion that this was a town that the, uh, the Jewish prisoners were running themselves. Uh, it was called Theresienstadt. And uh, there were sporting events that were staged. Uh, even some of the Germans uh, soldiers were participating so as to give some oomph to the, uh, to the sporting event, uh, soccer match and, and, uh, and other athletic events. So mm -hmm. yes, and, uh, and then of course there was the entertainment. Uh, the, uh, the children's opera Brundabar was performed and by that time they had already performed 15 uh, performances of the Verdi Requiem. This would be the 16th specifically put together for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the, the Nazis in attendance and uh, for the International Red Cross. And the International Red Cross, of course, was in the hip pocket of the Nazis at that time. I have an audience question for you. Uh, Janae writes to ask, how much advance notice did the Nazis have about the visit to put together their elaborate ruse? Uh, I don't know the specific answer to that, but my guess is from what I do know that uh, they would not have set a date that the Nazis uh, uh, needed in order to, uh, to fix the camp up the way they wanted. I mean, there were gardens that needed to be planted and uh, there were uh, all sorts of streets that were, I, I know there was a, a, a film, a, a movie, uh, a part of a film that I saw where uh, people were actually scrubbing the sidewalks to make everything look uh, presentable. By the time the Nazis came, it looked like a very quaint little village very lively, very active, and people uh, uh, presumably very happy. And yeah. that included playgrounds for the children. This, this stuff disappeared after the, 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 the Nazis and the Red Cross left. And uh, if I may say, there was one member of the Red Cross who was a young man from Switzerland named uh, uh, Maurice Roussel, 
uh, who was, uh, his father got him out of the service. His father was a high muckamuck in the Swiss government, got him out of the service. So he came and he was one of the people. And I remember Claude Lanzmann, the, the famous uh, originator and director of the, uh, the nine part film called Shoah. Actually, there's an outtake at the Holocaust Museum here in Washington, which shows Lanzmann saying, did you go into uh, where they live? Did you look here? Did you look there? And Roussel says, no, we didn't have to. If there was anything wrong, they could have told us about it. The Jews could have even passed us a note. Uh, I thought yeah. Lanzmann was going to come across the desk <laughs> yeah. at that point, the, the, the stupidity, naivete, and insulting nature of that comment. Yeah. So, so you mentioned before that, that um, a performance of Verdi's Requiem was part of the visit. And I want to show now um, a clip from Edgar Kraza, who was a choir member in the camp who participated in all 16 performances. And in this video clip that I'm about to show, Edgar Kraza describes the deeper meaning of the Requiem for Raphael Schechter. Yeah. In his mind, he transformed it from the mass for the dead into mass for the dead Nazis. And he wanted to tell them about the day of wrath coming and the Supreme Judge sitting in judgment and no sinner will escape. And he couldn't tell them in German. So he thought if he can sing it in Latin, he may get away with it. So this yeah, powerful also, last line, right? Yeah, it, it is wonderful. It is powerful. I mean, you know, I think, frankly, Rafi Schechter loved this work and he brought the score with him, not because when he came to Terezin, he, first, first of all, they didn't know where they were going. They, they just happened to be sent to this place. He had no idea that he would be able to put together any sort of performances. Nobody knew at this point. But as time went on and the arts and cultural community grew into significance, he decided to give it a try to attempt. And he recruited 150 singers and he taught them the Verdi Requiem. But I think he was particularly motivated by one piece of, 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 of uh, a text in the Dies Irae, the, the text that says, qui quid latet aparebit nil in nultum remenebit, that everything will be seen and nothing will remain unavenged. Okay, if you're praying as a Catholic, this is your relationship with God. But if you're a prisoner in a concentration camp, this is a way of shaking your fist and pointing the finger at it and says, God will take care of you. God will this, of see. course, is a photograph from the Red Cross visit of the performance. Murray, did this message get through? I mean, it, it, it clearly was powerfully felt, um, enough for Kraza to remember it decades later, but did they hear it? No, they all remembered it. Everybody I've talked to, either in the audience or actually in the performance, they all had a very clear idea of the power of, of this message, of the extraordinary meaning of the, uh, the Verdi Requiem uh, it, and the courageous nature of all these people to stand up there and sing it. But no, it didn't get through. I mean, first of all, uh, how many of the Nazis and, and of the Red Cross actually could understand the Latin? I would suspect nobody, or at least nobody would put it in the context that they meant. No, what was really important was they did it. There was, this was their defiance, the defiance against inhuman behavior, the defiance against the horror of the conditions and the insanity and the chaos in which they lived. There's the defiance. And it was like shaking their fist at the Nazis and looking them in the eyes and saying that God will seek the revenge that is needed. It's not for us to make revenge. That's God's department, as it were. And so I think that this was the strength of what they did. They got nutrition from this and they were inspired by it. And that's why they all remember Rafi so well because of how hard he worked to put this together. And by the way, he was down to 60 singers at this point from the original 150. Yeah, so singing itself in a way, it was a way to hold on to their humanity even as they are forced to participate and sing for the Nazis. That's correct. That's correct. But you know, I mean, the, the musical dimensions of Terezin had, had a lot of breadth. 
you know, if I may say something, you know, I, I found yesterday a, 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 um, a, a piece of uh, information from um, Victor Ullmann, who was a great composer in the camp, but he was also the self-appointed music critic of the camp. And he said the following about the, the Verdi Requiem. I'll make this fast. Yesterday's performance, it may seem right once again to emphasize Rafi Schechter, to whom Terezin musical life owes so much, whose stimulus gene and artistic activities have managed a performance of, listen to this, urban level, meaning this was big city stuff. Right. Schechter, Marie, I, oh, sorry. Ahead. I want to remind our audience, though, also, you know, what they're doing and the, what's remarkable about it is how is the circumstances, right? Let's turn now to a clip from another member of the chorus, Marianka Zadiko May, who described decades later in a testimony how particularly cruel this Nazi ruse for the Red Cross visit was for the children. <laughs> They play uh, funny operas and children's operas. And the children play on beautiful swings the, and, and, and rocking horses. And in the afternoon, they have an, an afternoon nap in the grass. And when they wake up, they each get bread and butter. These are children who had never seen butter, except that day. Deception is not the right word. There must be worse words for that. Two weeks later, there was nothing left. The swings were gone, the playpens were gone, the rocking horses were gone, and the children were gone, all into the gas chambers. Oh, what these children do to anybody? There's, there's nothing to be said. There's nothing to be said about that inhuman behavior. Can you tell us a little more about Marianka and her involvement with Raphael's chorus? Well, the best thing I can tell you is that I spoke to her about a little more than a week ago. She turned 97 just a few weeks ago. And, um, and she has extraordinary love and dedication to all matters of the Verdi Requiem, the uh, incredible uh, inspiration that Rafi Schechter offered her. She said that she lived because of, of the inspiration that she got from, uh, from Rafi Schechter. And I've heard that before as well. Um, she was a member of the chorus for all 16 performances. And if you tap her on the shoulder right now, and I would call her up and I'd say, Marianka, I can't remember how the Sanctus goes. She immediately would go at the Sanctus, 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 because she remembers it so well. It was a very important part of her young girl life. She was still a teenager, a late teenager. And she has been one of my teachers uh, who really not only inspired me, but put me into directions of discovery about uh, all things uh, Rafi Schechter and the Verdi Requiem at Terezin. It's remarkable also to note um, how much original art and music was created at Terezin. And I'm gonna connect this to one of our audience questions. Uh, Betty writes in, do you have a recording of the music that was played? And in fact, we do. Um, I wanna share now a short clip of original music made in the camp. And this is, uh, we get this clip from the Nazi propaganda film produced in the camp. It was called Theresienstadt. Yes, the, the composer is Pavel Haas, one of the most recognized composers. And this is called Etude for the String Orchestra. And after we look at it, I can tell you how they happened to put together a string orchestra. Yeah, 
the conductor is uh, Karel Ancharl, who actually ended his career as conductor of the Toronto Symphony. He made it, he made it through. He made it through Auschwitz. He lost his family, but he made it through Auschwitz. And uh, there are many composers who are members of that orchestra. Some of them brought their instruments with them. Uh, others could not do that. So the Nazis would uh, uh, send up from Prague from the collection of confiscated instruments from all over Europe, they would send up the number of violins needed, violas and cellos and so forth, and put together this ensemble just for the film that they were making, the propaganda film. And then immediately, as soon as that was over, all, all the uh, instruments went back to Prague into storage. They, this, the area in which they were stored was supposed to be part of what would be called the Museum to the Extinct Race. It's in the Jewish quarter of Prague. Uh, that's Can you put that in the context of what was going on in Terezin more broadly? Like, what was the scale of artistic production in this camp? Amazing. They put, they put together performances of the Magic Flute, of Tosca, of Fledermaus, and the most important opera of all to them was The Bartered Bride by Smetana. Now, that's the Czech opera, the Czech opera. We don't have an opera like that in America that we could say this represents opera in America. Uh, I think many of us thought maybe Porgy and Bess would become that, but it never did. And uh, uh, so we don't have such an opera. But today in the Czech Republic, I think you can easily find 20 performances a year of The Bartered Bride. So Schechter conducted a number of performances of that work. They sang a number of performances of it. And there was, as I said, there were some 20 composers at work writing new music. Why? because that's faith in the future. You can't stop. If you're an artist, you can't stop. You create, you lecture. There were 2,400 lectures given by 530 prisoners. And the one topic lectured on the most was literature. Why? Because these people read and they didn't have access to books and they wanted to hear from writers and people who taught literature. And so uh, it was a hotbed of cultural environment. Why? It was defiance. It was to, to protect against the inhuman treatment and the insanity and the chaos that was the overriding and overarching uh, attitude and demeanor and, and environment of, uh, of, uh, of Nazi uh, terrorism. And so they fought it by answering the worst of mankind with the best of mankind. And you said that word in the middle of um, explaining the meaning of all this art, defiance. And of course, that's the name of your foundation that honors the memory um, of this performance and of all the musicians in Terezin. And I, I really want to thank you for sharing this story with us today and for all the work you're doing. Uh, we need to close our program now, but I want to thank you, Murray, for joining us. And I want to invite all of our viewers to join us next Wednesday for our next installment. On July 1st at 9.30 Eastern time, we'll be having our next program. It's called American Trailblazers Who Fought Persecution at Home and Abroad. And it will recognize and honor the bold Americans who fought Nazi persecution in Europe and at the same time challenged racial discrimination in the United States. Thank you all and have a good week.